the use of mantras and idols and deities. The late Swami Bhuteshananda of the Ramakrishna order is telling us, quote, the image of God may be a material idol or God may be expressed through a word or a symbol. And such experiences are absolutely necessary in order to attain God realization. The human mind can conceive reality only through forms. It cannot conceive the formless. In the last video, we talked a little bit about mantras and gurus and this idea of going beyond the mind and the body, intellect and the logical way that we kind of understand things, and even spiritual matters. Throughout all kinds of traditions, religious traditions throughout the world, East and West, the use of symbols is used pretty much universally. Even if it's not anything from the well-known like crucifix or the many, many deities in Hinduism and the statues and the imagery in Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism, or even letters in Arabic in Islam used as a kind of symbol to pray and meditate on. Symbols in general are used. And this is where a lot of people might get mixed up, especially when you look at how symbols and deities and idols are used in the East so much so. And we know, you know, especially, particularly in Hinduism, I mean, throughout most Eastern traditions and like I mentioned prior, really all traditions, but Hinduism seems to be infamous for this use of deities. And there's a very big misconception that Hinduism is a very polytheistic, multiple gods kind of um, old world kind of uh, religion and way of seeing things. But in reality, you know, and if you know, you know, it's there's really one ultimate reality. This is kind of known, that there's one ultimate reality referred to as Brahman, right? That which we can not comprehend fully, but it is also present in all. And so all these deities in Hinduism, and I think this is a great, using Hinduism as a great example to kind of understand this point that Swamiji is saying, and is that it's it's not that these deities are, are literally God themselves, but they are an attribute of God. They are an aspect of God in which people worship. This is very, very important. And once you understand this, you know, not only Hinduism, but you begin to see all of religious practice and traditions in a very, very different light, where you might have seen it from a very surface level, kind of logical way, like, why are people doing this? Even when it comes to mantras, right? Like, why are people repeating things? Why do people worship these gurus and these statues? And it's not to say, and, and of course, when people practice as a form of practice, they do take the statue or the form or the formless or the scriptures or the letters literally to be divine, almost even, well, not even almost, but a lot of people consider it to be God. But ultimately, there is this kind of underlying truth that it is an aspect of God. It is something, it is a portal, so to speak. It is this kind of avenue in which we can focus on. Why do we do this? Well, in order to kind of go beyond the brain and the intellect, we kind of do have to have some kind of focal point, this center in which we focus on. And it can be, like I said in the last video, a mantra, a guru, a deity, an attribute of the divine. And the goal is ultimately to go beyond form. Now, this is very important because a lot of people will say, how do I, that, like, what is that? How do I go beyond form? Well, as we humans kind of may trick ourselves into thinking we're only this body and mind, it is still the most useful instrument that we have because it gives us the ability to recognize the divine, to have God realization. But in order to get there and to have some kind of realization, we more than likely, of course, unless you're maybe one of the few few people like Christ and Buddha and these these great teachers, avatars, these mystical figures, we probably have to go through form. As for us, having mantras and reminders can then keep us within this understanding throughout our day-to-day -day lives. It doesn't have to be something that, like just being a Christian only one hour every Sunday, but having this weaved into our every single bit of our being. And it brings us to another important point that the world itself in the material and form, it's not inherently bad or inherently evil. When we put all of our faith into the material, this is when things may get complicated. Because instead of seeing the 
the threads that bind reality together behind everything that we may understand or try to understand within our limited intellect, we really believe these forms to be what they are. And so people go to war over it. People take it to heart to such an extent that the attributes of the divine which they worshipped it for in the first place become actually an afterthought. So when we get too material and logical, this is when things become out of harmony. Why is this? Very simply because, like I said, there is a harmony to it. There is a mixture between that which is seen and unseen, that which is logical and beyond logic. Swamiji expands on this in the following here, quote, It may be asked, have we to remain bound by forms forever? No, we need not. Through the forms, we reach the formless. We can never reach the formless all of the sudden or directly without transforming our present state of mind. In the beginning, our mind cannot think in any way except through forms or symbols. So a symbol is absolutely necessary for spiritual practice, and the mantras are symbols representing divinity. Now, it's also important to mention, like I said in the last video, with all the information and access to information that we have, that this and the, the, the focus on symbols and the way that we may practice things, especially at first, might take a drastically different form considering how much our world is changing with the internet. I've seen many people who, you know, they might watch YouTube videos from <laughs> Sadhguru or Eckhart Tolle and they don't know a single thing about spirituality, but they kind of don't even realize they are kind of having a, a focus and using that as a symbol. So the practice is still there, but it's taking many, many different forms, which we probably never would have guessed a hundred years ago. So in a sense, it is necessary. And take it with a grain of salt. Like I said, you know, like Swamiji is speaking in a very traditional sense of focusing on a symbol. Well, don't take that too literally, because we can all relate to the underlying point here that you know, when we only kind of thought we are just this body and mind and, you know, from from the earth we came, the earth we shall return and nothing else, somebody brings up the formless and it's like, what on earth are you talking about? But then there we are having some kind of connection we've never felt before, maybe the first time reading the Gospels or the Tao Te Ching or the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita, and then suddenly we have kind of formed a connection with what he refers to as a a symbol, and through that we are experiencing the formless for the first time. If we love a particular aspect of God, represented in a particular image, we do not like the image to be maimed or deformed. Similarly, the mantra is to be repeated as it is, without introducing any changes. Further, we have to adhere to a single method of practice for the sake of concentration. As we begin to recognize the formless through these forms, yes, we begin to honor it in such a way that we never thought before. Like I mentioned, it's important to not get too focused on the form or the mantra or the guru or the deity itself, because like I said, if it becomes, if the formless that we are trying to access through these avenues becomes an afterthought, well, then it becomes material worship. It becomes idol worship. Please remember that the deity, the mantra, the symbol, the idol, the scripture, whatever it might be, that is used as an avenue to reach the divine. It itself is not really the divine. These things are here to help us, not the other way around. There's a story of Swami Vivekananda who was looking at the ruins. I don't remember exactly the details, but he was looking at the ruins of these Hindu temples that were destroyed by uh, Islamic invaders at the time. And these were Kali temples, and Kali being a, a deity of the divine mother, of the divine feminine of the universe. And he said something along the lines of like, Mother, you know, we shall rebuild and we shall fix this and you know, we're sorry for not protecting you. And in the story, Kali, the Divine Mother, responds in such a brilliant, beautiful way in saying, my son, I am here to protect you, not the other way around. 